Can we just like say, hey, God, 2023, it's a new year. We want to give ourselves to you this year and see what you want to do, um, do in it and through it. All right, so um, before I get too far into this, it's going to be a little bit of a weird message. So if you're just if you're new here today, new tuning in online, welcome. We're glad that you're here, but today is not your typical message. Typically, we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and you're like, oh, last week was Genesis 17. This week, Genesis 18. Today, we're going to take a pause because we're starting off a 21 days of prayer and fasting. Now, again, if you're new here, you're like, whoa. I don't know if I want to drink the Kool-Aid yet, all right? That's a little too much. Um, but I just want to encourage you. Again, it's a new year, and I want to say, hey, I think there's something powerful when we come together as a church to do something in pursuit of God. Now, some of you are thinking in your mind, you know, it's like, and we're actually going to go there in a minute, but Jesus says, you know, to pray, to give, to fast, and basically do it in secret and don't let anybody know about it. So some of you are like, you know what, why are we doing prayer and fasting as a church when Jesus says to go into your prayer closet? But there's so many instances in the Bible where they're actually praying together. The disciples come together. The disciples, part of the church, the early church in the book of Acts, chapter 13, it tells us that they were praying and fasting together, not just all secluded. It tells us they were together doing this. And so I think there's power when we come together with a purpose and a mission to say, hey, Lord, we're gonna, we want to spend these 21 days, the first 21 days of this year, and intentionally pray and fast together as a church. Now, I'll tell you a little bit in a, in a moment of what that kind of means and looks like. Um, so I hope that you wouldn't get scared. I think there's different levels to this. It could be different things, but my hope and prayer is that we would come together these 21 days, and this would be kind of a kickstart to your year. This wouldn't be something to check the box, okay, I got through 21 days, now I can just go back to life as usual as it was December 31st of last year, and now I'm just going to go back to my old habits. I hope that these 21 days you would intentionally pursue God and that you would catch fire so much so that you would not be okay with going back to the person and the way that you were and who you were and what you were living and doing before. Not to say that we're all some super lost, sinful person, but maybe you are. But I just want to say maybe, like, look at your life. Are you giving God 100%? Your mind, your thoughts, your words, your actions. And I pray that this, these next 21 days would be us getting, growing more intentional, aware of ourselves, our walk with the Lord, and that we'd give the Lord room to speak into our lives. And so um, before I go too much further, I just want to hit this. Not re First off, announcement-wise, no small groups this week, just so we get that out of the way. We'll hopefully resume next Wednesday, but so this Wednesday, you guys, are we're all off. Um, but um, before I get too far into everything, we have some books over there on the table. Did you see our, our bookstore? Fervent Bookstore is now open January 1st. We just opened it today. Um, and so actually what we've done, me and my wife, we chose some books and um, I debated if, like, should we try to like sell them or whatever, but I'm just going to say they're there for you guys. And it, part of my heart, my vision for this year is to equip the saints. Like that's obviously part of the church, but I want to do it more this year than ever before. And I think a big thing is reading, all right? Some of you might hate reading, but let me just say this, that leaders are readers, okay? You look at any great leader in the world and just just, just look at them. They're quoting other, other great leaders and they don't just happen to know them. Leaders are readers. Say that 10 times fast. All right, so we got a collection of books over there and I'll just let you know. Number one, um, you can all pick up one of these copies. This is Ordinary Servant by a friend of mine. He's kind of a mentor, pastor of mine, Ed Taylor. He's the senior pastor at Calvary Aurora in, in uh, Aurora, Colorado. And so this is the easy read. This is like, I don't know, 70, 80 pages. Some of you, that's terrifying. You're like, 80 pages? Are you kidding me? How am I ever going to read that? But let me just say, you got to start somewhere. If you hate reading, you got to just start somewhere. And my challenge to you I mean, obviously, there's going to be a lot of challenges coming your way today, um, so just be prepared. But one of my challenges for you is become a reader. If you hate reading, you're never going to learn to love it if you just avoid it your whole life. And so learn to love reading. And I think there's something special about reading a book. Some of you, you might be audiobooks. Anyone an audiobook fan? I've, I listened to a couple audiobooks this year, and while it's fine. It's like listening to a podcast. There's something different about reading a book when I can circle it, underline it. Um, and I don't know, you're just, for me, 
I, I get in a zone, if you will, when I'm reading, as opposed to like listening. It's just not the same for me. So everybody can grab a copy of Ordinary Servant there. It's just talking about we're basically ordinary people that God wants to use in extraordinary ways. And so grab that. And again, there's like 20 of them over there. And those are free for you. And then there's a collection of other books. And so number one, um, there's not 20 of every book because the bookstore didn't have that. Um, I would have bought 20 books of this one. Um, this is I Declare War by Levi Lusco. I just read this this past week. Um, it's a book that, I mean, if you've been in my office at my house, I have a lot of books, and most of them, sadly, are not fully read. I haven't read them all. So this one's been on my shelf for, I don't know, six months or so. And then the other day, I'm like, you know what? I want to read this book. And so picked it up, couldn't put it down. I finished it, and then I was like, I want to buy this book um, if, if we could for the whole church, but they only had three other copies and this one's mine. I'm sorry. I'm just going to be selfish and I'm keeping it. Okay. You, you guys don't care anyways. You're like, I don't want to read anyway. Go ahead. Keep your books. Um, but there's three of those if you want to pick that up, but there's also a bunch of other books and honestly, they're on different levels. I'd say from like left to right, I tried to like map it out. If you're like, Hey, I hate reading, um, it's something easier to read. Go on the left side. There's a book called Crazy Love by Francis Chan. It's a pretty easy read. It's easy to understand, and it will it'll change your life if you really just give yourself over to what God wants to teach you. And then kind of as you progress, there's like three or four books by Francis Chan. So if you guys go over there, you're like, man, they really like Francis Chan. I think Francis Chan is the man. Um, and you can come talk to me later if you don't like that. But I really, he's a great, great guy. Um, but Francis Chan there, there's a book called um, Until Unity. It's really about uniting the churches. I think that's a powerful book. You guys should read it. That was a book I actually listened to on an audio book this past year. And then there's a, um, a marriage book. So if you're not married, maybe don't pick that book. But if you are, it's called You and Me Forever. And so that's a book. There's only two copies on that table. But you guys can take that one. Then you kind of go further on. There's I Declare War. I think it's an easy read. It's kind of fun. It's exciting. But it's really what I feel like God is calling me to do for this year. And it's not because I read the book. I was feeling this already. And I feel like I picked up the book because I'm like, I want, I want to declare war on my flesh. I want to declare war on the things that are holding me back from the things of God. And so I picked that book up. I started reading it again. It's kind of an easy read. Levi Lusco is a guy who, um, he's a pastor in Montana at Fresh Life Church. And he's, I don't know how to describe him. Anyone know who I'm talking about like he's like I don't know he's got all the references so if you guys watch like movies and tv shows and all the stuff like you're gonna love him because you're gonna be on track I'm like I don't understand your reference to Jedi people oh, Levi sorry I know I've never watched a Star Wars movie um but fun fact about myself but Levi Lusk goes a good read and then you kind of progress over to the other end of the table there's a book called Mere Christianity. It's a great book, but it is a bit of a tough read. So if you're not a good reader, if you're like a beginner, don't pick that book because you're going to hate reading and you're going to be like, I don't want to do this ever again. So just don't do that. But if you're like more advanced, you like reading, you haven't read that book yet, pick that book up, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And then there's also another book. It's called um, The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. Also another book that's a little more advanced. It's pretty, it's an easier read. It's not a super thick book. But again, if you hate reading already, I wouldn't recommend starting with that book. Okay, you guys cool with that? I know um, it's my announcements, I suppose. But to me, I just want us to become readers and learn to read. Like there's so much good stuff out there, especially just like when, pursuing God and the things that he has for us and so much time's wasted just watching TV and movies that mean nothing and we could be reading we could be pouring ourselves into the things that God wants to do and he wants to shape and mold us into the men women and even children right of of who he wants us to be and I think books are important so check that out on the way out pick up a book um, again it's free I'll just I, I want to encourage you guys to pick one out, but if you don't want to get a book, um, like you're like, hey, I'm not going to read it, just don't take it, all right? Don't pretend that you're going to read it, um, and then you, you don't, right? Just bring it back, I guess, next week. If you're like, you know what, on second thought, this, there's 250 pages, I'm not going to do it. Just bring it back, put it on the table, but my encouragement to you guys is to pick a book out, and everybody 
to pick this out and, and maybe my challenge to all of us these 21 days let's just read through this right it's like 80 pages that's I don't know to me that's a couple hours of reading at most but maybe for some of us it's a couple of days I don't know but I think we should do it you guys in you guys down maybe some of you yeah I'm not too sure about your guys response but We'll see. Leaders are readers. You want to be a leader. Honestly, everybody is a leader to some degree, too, if you look at it this way. You're leading somebody. Parents, you're leading your kids, right? Coworkers, you're leading coworkers at work. If you're married, your spouse, you're leading your spouse. But enough of that. Let's pray. And I just want to go over a couple passages, hopefully quickly, but it might be a while. We'll see. So, Father, we just come before you again this year. Uh, we thank you for a new year, a new day, Lord. Your mercies are new every morning, Lord, not only every morning, but every moment, God. And I pray that we would seize this moment, Lord, and that we would come before you, lay ourselves down, humble ourselves, our minds, our hearts, Lord, and that we would surrender ourselves unto you. God, I pray that you'd give us a renewed mind this morning, Lord, that's a transformed mind, a new heart, God, and that you would do a work inside of us. God, I pray, Lord, that, that you have great things for us this year. Lord, and I know also, though, with great things is going to come great difficulty. And Lord, so I pray, God, that you'd give us the strength for this year. Lord, and so as we look to your word, God, I pray that you would encourage us, challenge us, Lord. I pray that you would unify us on the same level, Lord, as we enter into this 21 days of prayer and fasting. And we pray this and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So today's message title, if I was going to label it something, is I Declare War. I'm just going to take Levi Lusco's message uh, title. I'm not going to preach his book, but it is I Declare War. And so for me, again, looking at 2022, it was a, it was a very good year, especially as a church perspective. Many of you started joining our church this last year, and there was great things. I look back on the year. We had baptisms, four baptisms, right? Um, some of you here in the room. And that's just like to me, like that's what it's about. When you see people stepping out of their old life to give themselves to Jesus and to be baptized and to follow him, to me, like that's that's what we're here for, to make disciples. And so that was exciting, right? We look at different things we've done, tornado relief. We came together as a church. Again, we're a small church, but man, we did big things. We gave away five thousand dollars to these homes that were hit by the tornadoes. I don't know if you realize that, but that's a big deal in my opinion. I'm like, again, I don't think many people think, well, you're not a big church, so you're probably not going to do big things. No, we serve a big God, and He can do big things with the little stuff that we bring. And so we did the tornado relief. We did all kinds of other stuff, right? Back to school rally. That's super fun. If you ask me, like a couple thousand kids and their parents coming out and the school is just so nice that they let us literally set up our tent and our sign that says, so that people may know Jesus. And to me, it's like that we're just being bold for Jesus going out there. Like we don't care what they say. Yeah, we're Jesus freaks and come and talk to us about it. Right. And one person a parent came up and said, you know, it's so refreshing to see a, a church here at this school rally with a sign that says so that people may know Jesus. He said that he was from Seattle, and he said that in Seattle that would never be allowed on a public school campus ever. And so he's like, it's just refreshing to see him. To me, I'm like, man, that's the stuff. We're out there in the community doing things. But then also stuff we did as a church, we started meeting here in this building. The week before Easter was our first week meeting in the school. And we've been meeting here ever since. And there's just been some good things in that regard. But I also know when I look back on 2022, that there's been some great difficulties as well. And that's kind of where, what happens. It goes hand in hand. And you need to know that as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, that when you're following Jesus, you will see great victories, but it's not going to come without great difficulties as well. And I, and I, I hate that, but that's the truth. I wish I could tell you it's going to be smooth sailing, that everything's going to be great. You're going to be blessed. Your kids are going to be blessed and healthy. Everything's going to go great. Um, you're going to be financially blessed. But honestly, I don't see that in Scripture, and I don't think that that's the truth. God does want to bless you, but his blessings often look different than what we'd like them to be. And so I look back on 2022, and there's things where I'm like, man, God, like that wasn't fun. I, I didn't like that. A couple of weeks ago, I told you guys about my daughter. Um, she has a, a blood condition, I suppose, called ITP. And we had to go to the, um, 
the doctor the other day, and it's, it turned out to be nothing more than what we already saw, but it was very worrisome for me and my wife when we got a call from the, blood and can- the Children Blood and Cancer Center and said, we need you to bring NOLA in as soon as you can. And so for us, immediately, it was like, what's going on? And to me, it was like I went to a, a dark spot. Honestly, I, if you know some about me, like it's just I got great faith, but man, my faith and my feelings, they collide more than I'd like to admit, but it really does happen. And I'm like, I know what God's word says, but man, what I'm living right now just does not feel good. It does not feel like this is of God or something, right? And so I was struggling this past week um, before going into this. Me and my wife were, were sad, were all the things, were praying, crying out to God. And honestly, I had, and this is just me being honest and real with you guys. In my mind, me and my conversation with God, I was already like writing my resignation letter. I'm like, God, if something happens here, I don't know what I'm going to do. Honestly, I know that you're true. I know that you're real, but I don't know. And I'm just being honest. I know. Maybe this is too much, right? Too much? Um, I'm like planning my resignation letter. I'm just like, God, I don't know what I'm going to do if something happens like that. And I mean, thankfully that didn't happen, but for me it's like, I was in a dark spot for a couple of days where it's just like, I don't know how I'm gonna get out. I gotta preach on Sunday. What are you gonna talk about? I'm like, I'm struggling with believing God's word here. And I had to reassure myself. That's when I picked up this book, I Declare War, by the way, because I'm like, I need something and, and I need something more. And this book, it talks about taking control of your mind is one of the things that it says your mind your words your actions and ultimately that your power comes from God and those are kind of the four principles that he gives but your mind and honestly I was letting my mind kind of go rampant right it's like I go to the worst place worst case scenario and I'm in this dark cave and I'm wondering why I feel this way and I feel like God's like you need to remind yourself of the truth and again sometimes it's hard to to grasp because you look at God's word and you see things like promises that he has a plan and a purpose and a future, right? And he wants to uh, prosper you, right? Jeremiah 29, 11, a lot of people quote that. And you see stuff like that, but then you're feeling your life. And you're like, this doesn't feel right. You guys been there, right? I know some of you, you've been through the hard stuff this last year, even recently. And, and it's hard. But here's what I want to encourage us, I suppose. For one, I know what it's like to be there, but I want to encourage you to join me in in a sense on a journey of declaring war this year where it's like, you know what? The devil has taken enough hope and joy from my life, right? That's the thing. It's like bad things are going to happen, but here's what we have a choice is how are we going to view them? Trials will come, but what's our response to the trials going to be? And that's kind of what I'm thinking of, right? It's like, man, I wasn't responding in faith to my trials and the things that were going on in my mind. What could happen? What's going on, God? Why is this happening? And I wasn't responding in faith. And I had to check myself because I'm like, I'm letting Satan steal everything from me. He's stealing my hope, my faith, my joy, my peace. And I'm like, I, I, and I don't know, I guess I got fed up with myself and I'm like that's enough that's enough I'm not you know not today Satan not anymore Satan I'm fighting back I'm not going to let you have the last word I'm not going to let you put thoughts and words and things into my mind into my heart not anymore and honestly one of the things you need to realize when this stuff happens to you to you hardship trials when the enemy comes with lies and deceit I don't know if you what you may struggle with Levi Lusco in this book he kind of goes, I will, will warn you, if you start reading this book, please finish it. Don't stop after the first chapter. It's dark. It's depressing. He's very open, raw, and real. And so he struggles with um, harming himself. I'll say it that way, right? Ending him, his own life, I suppose. And he struggles with that, and he tells his story about it. But it's like, I forget where I was going with that. But again, if you read it, you got to read the whole thing because... You, you can't stop there. See, Satan wants to put those thoughts into your head, and that's, what he, that's where I was going. He talks about how these thoughts would come into his head to harm himself, and he's like, I don't know why. I, I, I don't think this way. I don't want to do any of these things, but this thought just keeps coming into my head, and, and he didn't know what to do with it, and then he just had to fight back, where he's like, I need to fight back. I need to stop letting the devil win, and he goes on to say, it's like when, when that stuff happens, it's evidence 
that you matter. If Satan's trying to convince you that your life doesn't matter, really that's evidence that your life matters more than you think. Right? When the devil's trying to lie and say, hey, you're not good enough, you, you, you will never be able to do it, that should be evidence that, no, God is calling you to do it, and he is enough, and he will fulfill you, he will lead you through. And so that's something for me where I'm like, okay, I'm not going to let Satan steal my joy anymore because I'm listening to his lies. Right? Romans, um, if you want to put it on the screen, uh, Louis, Romans 7. If you guys have your Bibles, you can read it. Do you have it there? Did it work out? Okay, cool. We are having some like weird stuff with our screen earlier. Romans 7. Maybe you guys feel this way looking at uh, 2022 or just any given day maybe even. Romans 7 verse 15 says, For I do not understand my own actions. And this is Paul speaking. You need to understand this, that Paul... If you know the Bible, Paul's like a superstar, right? He's like the MVP, Hall of Fame, Bible writer. He wrote, what, 13, um, 13 letters, chap or books of the um, New Testament. And he's like the superstar. You're like, man, no one will be like Paul. He's so great. He's so awesome. Check this out. He says, he says for I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but the very thing I hate, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law, with the law, that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. And we'll pause there for a second. I don't know. You guys feel that way ever? Right? You have hopes and thoughts and dreams for the day. Man, I'm going to be so productive. I'm going to do this. I'm going to check in on my friend, ask them how they're doing. I'm going to pray for them. This is stuff that I think about anyways. And then the day kind of gets away, right? Satan kind of just bombards us with distractions. And one of the biggest distractions I've found, maybe you will too, if you think about it, is that your your biggest distraction, right? Why, why don't you get things done? Well, because you let your mind go wild, because you let yourself get busy with all these other things, right? But if we can stay focused, man, maybe we could get some stuff done. But I love that Paul's open and honest. He says, the good that I want to do, that's not what I do. And he says, the evil that I don't want to do, that's actually what I end up doing. Now, some people might think, well, this is just like a hypothetical that Paul's writing because he's explaining how the law is good to reveal to us that sin is real and that we need a Savior. Maybe so, but I think Paul is saying something a little more real than we think. And he's saying, I want to do good all the time. But he says that I find this law working within myself that my flesh is also working. My flesh is leading me to sin. The flesh being just your natural body, right? A lot of people are like, oh, well, it's natural. I just feel like this is what I'm supposed to do, and I've always had this desire. Well, your natural desires more often than not are, are sinful desires, right? Oh, you, you want the whole world to revolve around you. Well, that's pride, selfishness, right? I want everyone to cater to me, to check in on me. Well, that's pride, that's selfishness. I want to be rich. Well, that's that's not in the Bible as to what God wants you to do and what, what he wants you to be. He wants you to be spiritually rich, right? And we look at things and we just see our sin nature. Maybe we want to satisfy it with things, drugs, alcohol, pleasures, experiences, right? It's like that is our flesh crying out. And Paul would say, man, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that my flesh, my sin nature wants to do, those are the things that I end up doing, but here's the thing he goes on to say, this is verse, um, we'll, we'll jump down to verse 24, Louis. He says, wretched man that I am. You ever think that about yourself? I think it's all right to realize sometimes that you're fed up with yourself, but the point is that you need to realize that and be like, now what am I going to do? If you stay at the point where it's like, well, wretched man that I am, wretched woman, I'm, I'll never be good enough. I'll never amount to anything. If you stay there, you won't. 
You're buying the lie of the enemy. And I love what Paul goes on. He says, wretched man that I am. He says, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then here's the good news. Verse 25, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. There's, there's power. There's freedom in Christ. Jump with me to, um, if I, did I give you the, uh, sorry, I wrote this message like three or four different times, so I got three or four different sets of notes, but um, if we got in there, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3, we'll put this on there. I love this. This is Paul again. He's writing to the Church of Corinth. Church of Corinth has many problems. So if you're like, hey, man, I got problems. I'll never be part of the church. Just read the book of Corinthians. You'll feel good about yourself. They got some real issues going on. But God still loves them. God still loves us. Paul's writing them. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, right? Remember in Romans, he's talking about, man, uh, the flesh, it's waging war against me. The things I don't want to do, that's what I end up doing. The things that I want to do, I don't ever do. And he gives this encouragement. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. So what does that mean? When we're like trying to follow Jesus and pursue the things that he has for us, you need to understand that, number one, you're in a war, whether you like it or not. You can choose to ignore it and say, oh, Nick, you know what? I think you're just over-exaggerating the situation and whatever. You're just trying to make a point. I don't think so. We're, We're at war. And the question is, are you going to engage in this war or are you going to sit on the sidelines? And really sitting on the sidelines, you're you're going to lose the war. You're going to forfeit it. Jesus promises us victory. He's already won really the war, if you will, but we're battling every day. We're living it out every single day. And so he says, we walk in the flesh, but we're not waging war according to the flesh. So what he's saying is we're at war, but it's not like a fleshly war. This is a spiritual battle, and to fight a spiritual battle, what do we think we need? We need some spiritual weapons. You can't just go out there with the the strength of the flesh. Jesus said that, right? He's like, your your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak, right? Your flesh will not accomplish the things of God. So he says, not waging war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. In verse 5, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. And this is probably where I'll, I'll, I don't know, we'll go a little bit into Matthew in a bit, but I guess one of my main points, I might do a couple sermons on this, so just a heads up. Um, But I want us to understand this, taking every thought captive to obey Christ. Right now in your life, do you let your do you take your thoughts captive? Thought comes in, what do you do with it? Do you do anything with it? Do you just let your mind go? Right? Honestly, if you let your mind go, you're just kind of asking for some I don't know, you're asking for you're asking for it, right? Not not a good way. You're letting your mind go free. It's like your mind will wander. And you might think, well, no, I got a strong mind. I'm strong-minded. I'm strong-willed. I got this and, and nothing to worry about. But man, if we're not taking our thoughts captive to Christ, how do you know that your thoughts are even good for you? All right? Oh, man, I'm going to go start a business. I'm going to do all these things, X, Y, and Z this next year. It's like, but do, have you ever brought that thought captive unto Jesus and said, but Jesus, what do you want me to do with my life? Do you want this for me? If you would open the door, show me the way. If you don't want this for me, close the door. Do you take those thoughts captive? What about the thoughts that when the devil does come and whispers in your ear something like you're not good enough and that thought crosses your mind, do you take that captive and bring it unto Christ? Say, oh man, I'm hearing this, but Jesus, here's what I'm struggling with. What do you say? And honestly, when we come before God, we give him the opportunity to sort it out. And this is why I think prayer and fasting is so important, because it helps us to put our mind, body, our our soul, everything just in check with the Spirit. Where we're going to say for 21 days, and honestly, I hope it goes for more than 21 days, just ripples throughout your life where I want to practice prayer and fasting, not just once a year, but maybe once a day. Definitely praying once a day, but fasting 
more than once a year, but to where we could take control of ourselves. Paul says that he, he beats his flesh into submission at one point. Like he's like, hey, man, my, my body, my sinful body wants to take me into sin so much that I'm going to put it in submission to be under the obedience of Christ. Now, that's some pretty strong language. And again, he's like, we're not waging war like people in the world. We're waging war against spiritual beings. Now, let me, again, going to prayer and fasting, prayer and fasting are spiritual weapons, I don't know if you think about it this way. These are things, tools, I suppose you could say, that God has given us to use. Right? The Bible, all throughout the Bible, it says, talk, talks about praying. Pray without ceasing, right? But then it also talks about fasting. Now, this day and age, what is this, the 21st century, right? The, I don't know, I feel like the world looks at fasting, and me as a pastor in the, at church, talking about fasting, we almost treat it like politics, right? Like, oh, you can't. Talk about politics in the pulpit, that's, that's weird, right? People are like, oh, you can't talk about fasting. But let me just say this, Jesus talks about fasting. Jesus fasted himself. And if Jesus did these things, why don't we talk about them more? Why don't we practice them more? We think, oh, that's an old ritual, right, from way back when, and we don't really do that anymore. And that might be true of the culture and what we do, but man, Jesus taught on it. Jesus says these things, um, Matthew chapter 6, turn there with me. If you guys have been with our small groups, you guys will be very familiar with this. This is Jesus talking on the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, Jesus says in uh, Matthew 6, um, do we have the whole chapter in there? By, yeah, sweet, awesome. So, so, um, Jesus says, verse 1 of chapter 6, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. Now, that's the kind of the key here in all the things Jesus is going to say. Don't practice your righteousness in order to be seen. Don't pray in order to be heard. Don't fast in order for people to recognize you. He's like, don't worry about other people is what he's saying. Now, it's all about a matter of the heart. I know the guys, we talked about this when we went through this passage in our small groups where it's like, it's, it's about your heart. Is your heart to be seen or is your heart to draw near to God, to honor God? Because I, my pastor back in Tucson, man, he says like, there's going to be times when you're obeying God and you're going to give to the needy and people are going to see it. But it's about obeying God, not about me getting recognition. Now, that's it's a matter of the heart. And so Jesus says here, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. And he says this, verse 2, Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues, and in the streets that they may be praised by others. And we'll pause here for a second. I just want to say, he says, when you give, when you give. He says three things in this chapter, and I'll just summarize it real quick. He says, when you give, verse 5, he says, when you pray, in verse 16, he says, and when you fast. Jesus, God in the flesh teaching the greatest sermon ever, the Sermon on the Mount. It's one of those mic drop moments where at the end of it, he drops the microphone, the Pharisees are stunned, the disciples are stunned, nobody knows what to say. They're like, that was amazing, that wrecked my life. I don't know what to do anymore, Jesus. I'm just going to keep following you, right? And so he gives the best sermon, and in there he says, when you give, when you pray, when you fast. What does that sound like for us as Christian followers of Jesus? What should we be doing? We should be doing these things. They're things that are expected of the believer. These are not things that are suggested. Hey, if you feel like giving to the needy, helping them out, if you feel like being generous, then maybe you can do it. But if you don't want to, then don't, don't do it. Hey, if you feel like praying to me today and you're in a good mood and things are good, yeah, maybe you pray. But if you don't feel like praying, then you know what? You know, just take a year off and go um, do you. People tell you that ever? I hate that when someone says, yeah, just do you. One lady said that at the gym the other day. I said, do you, boo? I said, oh, whatever. I can't say anything because I'm the new guy there. I'm like, but one day I'm going to earn my stripes. I'm like, you know what? That's terrible advice. Don't do you. Do what I tell you to do because I studied this stuff. 
if you want to get your desired results, just listen to me. But it says, when you pray, not if you feel like praying. And then he says that third one, when you fast. That's the, that's the one that, man, like, you would be like, oh, yeah, church always talking about giving and praying all the time. But churches don't talk about fasting very much. When you fast. Now, what is a fast? Right? Some of you know, some of you don't. And fasting, I mean, biblically speaking, is giving up food for a season. And in the Bible, too, it's often um, in context of mourning. Right? Mourning. Nehemiah. We went through Nehemiah not too long ago. Nehemiah in chapter 1, he's fasting before the Lord. And why is he fasting? Because he's heard this terrible news that his people, his city, is still lying in ruins. And he's fasting. And so he fasts and he prays. Right? And if you know the story of Nehemiah, an amazing story. He's an ordinary guy. He's not, he's not a prophet. He's not a priest. He's not anything like that. He's just an ordinary guy, cupbearer to the king. And he fasts and he prays. And then God does something extraordinary in his life, uses him to rebuild the wall. He fasts and he prays because he sees a problem. And, and he, I don't know, I just imagine it like he, he just can't eat. He's sick to his stomach. Maybe you've ever been that way. Again, man, some of the things that I've seen in my life, my wife's life this last year, there's been a lot of great things, but there's been a lot of times where I'm like, I just... It's not even that I'm intentionally fasting. It's just that I just have no appetite. And I'm just like, God, I'm, I'm wrestling with God. Which, I mean, you look at the Bible and Jacob and he pops his hip out, right? You're like, I shouldn't wrestle with God. I know that. But sometimes you're like, God, I, I just need, need to know. I need, need something. And so you just, you fast. And, and you cry out unto God. And again, praying and fasting, I think, go together. It's not just, oh, I'm just fasting in the sense that I'm not eating food. If you're, if you're fasting and you're not praying, really all you're doing is following a diet. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. You can have that diet. That's fine. Seriously, like if you want to, 2023, whatever year it is now, right? It's January 1st, and I want to have a new diet, nutrition. Get that stuff together. That's cool. Awesome. Good goals. But if you want to fast, like you need to be giving up food or whatever it may be, and you're seeking God. Not just like, oh, well, you know what? I gave up Doritos, right? Or gave up sweets, um, something like that. That's, again, that's great. But if we're not giving up something to follow and seek God, it's just, it's just a diet. And fasting, I'll say this again, scripturally, it's always in reference to food, right? Food and water, giving up food. I think a fast should be something that's hard. I think it, should be, it shouldn't be something that's easy. I gave this example a while back where I said, you know, if I gave up soda, I'm like, I'm fasting from soda. For some of you who know me, you're like, you don't ever drink soda. And I'm like, yeah, I know, but I'm giving up soda, right? It's like, that's not a challenge. And what does that say about my devotion to God? God, I'm gonna give up soda. He's like, Nick, you have one or two sodas a year. Maybe I have more. Sometimes it's like, man, tacos and a Pepsi, it's just something about it, I don't know. Coca-Cola, if they have it, if, or Sprite. Those are my only things. I don't drink them often. So to, for me to give that up, that's not hard, right? Or maybe for some of you, right? You're, you're like, well, you know what? Maybe I'll give up social media. You're like, you don't even have social media. What are you talking about? Like, you know, like, I just want to say, whatever fasting is, it should be something that's, that's hard, and it should be a sacrifice, where, it says, where you're saying, God, I'm giving up this thing because I want to pursue you. And when we give up like food specifically, it's literally us saying, God, I'm giving up something I physically need to seek you, pursue you, who I spiritually need, and that's more important than my physical well-being. I know it's crazy, right? You're like, what do you mean? You got to eat. Like, yeah, God knows that. He says that in, in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, seek first, first my righteousness, God's righteousness. And he says, all these other things, food, clothes, shelter, it'll be added to you. But man, if we could just say, God, I want to seek you first and foremost, above all else. I'm going to give up whatever it is. I'm going to give up um, breakfast. I don't know. I'll, I'll let you know what my fast is going to be. So I'm going to be giving up breakfast, I suppose. I'm not going to eat till. 12 o'clock, that's my goal for these next 21 days. And it's like, for me, I want to start every single day for these 21 days where I'm just, I'm coming before the Lord, pray, fasting, seeking God, getting in his word. And that's, that's part of the key here. Again, if you're fasting and you're not praying, it's just a diet. But then if you're also not reading scripture, you're not hearing from God. 
And so when we're seeking God, go to the source. Don't just be like, oh, you know what? I gave up this food, but I don't really feel like anything's happening. Are you reading his word? Because I promise he's going to speak to you. I, I promise he's got stuff for you. If you would listen, if you would humble yourself and say, God, here I am. And so we want to come before God. And so with this, again, what Jesus says here, he says, when you give, when you pray, when you fast, not not so much suggestions, but expectations that God has of his followers. And he says this, and I don't know if we put this one in there, Louis, but verse 19, Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I'll end with saying this here today. When we're talking about, when when I'm talking about declaring war anyways, it's like I got to put in some practical things. Praying and fasting for one, big things. But just look at what Jesus says. When you give, when you pray, when you fast, he's giving us tools right here, right now. We say, well, how do I win this war? How do I start to wage war in this spiritual thing? Not according to the flesh, right? As Paul would say, it's like, well, we take every thought captive, but take what Jesus says. Start to be a generous person. Start to be a prayerful person and start to fast. I know it sounds weird, but honestly, it's God's word. I know you guys are like, this is, this is the weirdest thing. Like, I got to go on a diet, man. But God says to do this. And when he says the next thing, he's like, don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. And what do you think he's kind of saying? I, th- I feel like he's saying like the opposite of, of giving, praying, and fasting is like, well, we're going to keep things. We're going to be all about ourselves, and we're going to uh, be gluttons, I suppose. We're going to indulge as much as we want. And Jesus is saying here, when you're doing that, you're storing up treasures on earth, but it's not going to last. It, it, it will be destroyed. And he says, don't do that. He says, store up treasures in heaven. And I love that he says, says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. I wanted to call this message the layup, right? You guys are basketball fans, right? The layup's like the most basic um, shot there is, I would say. It. I mean, maybe I'm not a basketball pro, so I can't say for certain but like if, as a kid, the first thing you learn how to do is to, to do a layup because you just can't shoot because you're terrible. So you just go and you do a layup, right? It's like it's the easiest move. Um, it's an easy bucket. And I feel like Jesus is almost saying that. Of course, he probably didn't have basketball in his mind, but I just can't help but think this way. And I feel like Jesus is like, man, you want an easy bucket? Be generous. Give. You want an easy bucket? Pray. Pray to the Father. He even gives us an outline. You're like, well, how do I pray? Uh, you're in luck. Jesus says, pray then like this. And you can read it. It's the, the Lord's Prayer there. And then he says, you want an easy bucket? Fast. When you do these things, you're laying up treasure for yourself in heaven, treasure that matters, treasure that lasts, rather than treasure on earth that's just going to be here for a moment and gone the next. And so I don't really have a smooth like landing to this whole thing today, but I, my encouragement for us is that we would seek God on a new level this year. Of course, I can't make you guys do anything. Those of you tuning in online, I can't make you do 21 days of prayer and fasting, but I would ask that you would at least consider it, that you would pray to God and say, God, is this something that I should do? Should I give myself to this? And and how will I do this fast if I do it? Maybe the food things is too hard, but maybe social media is a vice for you. You spend way too much time on it and you need to give it up. Start there. Start there. That's a great start. Maybe TV, maybe movies is one of your vices where it's like, man, I spend five hours a day on, on the television, right? Where it's like, man, what if you just spent, if you ever think about it this way, the five hours you spend on, say, your phone, there's studies out there and you can look them up. I think they say on average the person does spend five hours on a screen a day or something crazy like that. Um, But just think about it. If you just took one of those hours and you devoted it to reading the Bible every day, all right, hey, I'm going to give up one hour of TV, but I've still got four other ones. Isn't that crazy? And then you start to pour into one hour of reading the Bible intentionally. 
Man, imagine how much you would grow in 21 days, but imagine how much you would grow in a year. By the end of the year, you'd be like, man, I read the whole Bible twice. Right? I don't know if you know this, but you could read the whole Bible. They say it's 70-something hours. It takes 70-something hours to read the whole Bible just at, like, regular speed. Not crazy, right? And you think to yourself, oh, man, I could never read the Bible. 70 hours, that's three days, right? But again, you say one hour a day. I'm just going to read one hour a day. That's 70 days. That's not even half of the year. You could read the whole Bible front to back. Be pretty crazy, huh? Pretty cool until you hit Leviticus. That's when you got to drink an energy drink and you need to push through, but it's still good. Um, but man, just imagine what we could do. I don't know. I just think I'm a guy who, I don't know if I'm a big vision guy, a big faith guy, because honestly, like after last week, I'm like, I feel like I don't have any faith, but I'm also the kind of guy where I feel like we have tremendous potential. Maybe by myself, I don't have much, but man, when I look at our church, I'm like, we're so gifted. We have so much good things that we could do. If we come together, we just pour all, all of it out at the feet of God, and we say, here it is, God. What do you want to do? I just, I'm like, man, we could change the world. I really believe it. I don't know. You, I know that's cliche, but I just think, man, we got the Holy Spirit in us, and He has gifted us for impact, and He's given us giftings, and He's Calling us into this war, which I mean, again, it's not an encouraging thing. We don't like to think that. But that's the reality. But it's an honor, it's a blessing to be on, in the Lord's army, to, to fight for the Lord. And I just want to encourage you, wherever you're at today, maybe you're, you're down, you're depressed. Again, I know what it's like, but I want to encourage you to get up that you didn't enter into this 21 days of prayer and fasting. Maybe your attitude is more like, I just need to wrestle with God. I need to get some, some thoughts off my chest towards God. Pray to God. Be honest with God. There's no use lying to God. God knows the truth, right? You, you realize that? When we're repenting and confessing our sins to God, it's not because we're letting God in on our secret. Oh, God, I accidentally went and did this last night. Oh, what? you did? God's not surprised. When we confess and repent, it's us saying, I recognize that I'm wrong. And I'm coming to you, God. But bring your thoughts, your prayers, everything, anything unto God. David is a, is a king who is called a man after God's own heart. But if you read through the Psalms, you'll see that he's got some pretty crazy prayers. If you ever read through it, right, he's like, man, smash the teeth of my enemy, right? It's like... And he talks about all this stuff. It's just, it's wild. It's crazy. You're like, man, you're a violent guy, David. You got some problems, dude. Um, and he's probably like, that's why I wrote so many Psalms. because I got to get off my chest, man, bring it to God. But I just want to encourage you wherever you're at, you might be hurting. You might be struggling in your faith. Bring it to God. Bring your doubts to the one who has it all figured out, who can help reroute you and rebuild your faith today. And that's Jesus Christ. And so bring, bring whatever it is. Maybe you're doing great. 2022 was the best year of your life. Bring that to God. Praise Him. Rejoice in Him. Seek Him for what He would want to do for, with you today in this new year. Again, for me, I just I want to get more serious than ever. I don't want to let Satan steal any more hope and joy, and I want, I want to please God. I want to hear at the end of my life, well done. Right? I don't want to go see Jesus I was telling my friends about this. Um, we're talking about New Year's resolutions, and I just said, you know, I don't want to, to get to the end of my life and see Jesus and think, man, I, I had more on the table. That I gave 80%. Yeah, maybe you, you know what I mean? Like, I don't want to end my game, if you will, my life, and be like, I could have done better. I could have scored more. I could have gave more. I could have prayed more. I could have fasted more. could have done more for Jesus in his name's sake. I don't want that. I want to be like, God, I, I went all out. Maybe I don't have much to show for it, but, but God would know. And I, and I hope and pray that that would be your heart, that you want to end well. And when you meet your maker, when you meet Jesus face to face, you'd hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And you'd hear it because you, you followed him. You ran your race well. You didn't give up. You finished. I gave the example I don't know, when, when did we run that race? September? October. 
I ran a Spartan race. I don't recommend it. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, it was, uh, what was it, a half marathon, 13 something mi point something miles. Anyways, first time I ever did one, um, it was a great experience. I'll say that much. But what I, I loved about it was like if you just finished the race, it could take you 20 hours, it could take you four hours, it could take you, however, what did the fastest people do in like two hours? I don't know. They did it really fast. We were not so fast. We were in the middle of the pack. They were pretty good. But if you just finished, you got a medal. You got a medal. At the end of the race, they're there. You get a medal. Hey, good job. And, and you get to, to leave with something. Right? And I just think that's awesome. And it's like, again, with our race with God, just finish your race. Some people are going to be running faster than you. That's okay. Don't, the Bible says don't compare yourself to others. Like we're, we're, that's silliness, right? Don't compare yourself to others. Compare yourself to what God's called you to do, right? And so some might be running faster. That's okay. Let them run. Encourage them. Hey, keep going, right? Some might be running slower. That's okay. Encourage them. Say, hey, keep up the good work. Finish your race. And what I want to say today, declare war on your, your fleshly desires. Declare war on the things that Satan's trying to steal from you and just get into the word with God and finish your race. We don't know if we have tomorrow. If Jesus came back today, would you be like, yeah, I, I did my best to live for you? And honestly, if you try to tell him that and it's not the truth, like he knows everything. And so I just want to encourage you, take, this, take your life seriously. Jesus took it ser so serious that he died for you on the cross. And if he thought you and me special enough to die for, I think that should tell us something that, man, he is good enough worthy enough to live for. And I hope that this year we would just strive after that more than ever before. And I hope these 21 days is just a start, a kick start, right? It's, a, it's the pregame for the rest of the year. Like, hey, we're going to pregame this thing, load up on prayer and fasting so that when whatever comes, so you, you got to prepare for the trials. If you prepare for the trials beforehand, when the trials come, the enemy comes, the lies come, you can say, no, God said this. I've already prepared myself for this battle. So let's prepare ourselves these 21 days for whatever God has ahead. And again, re just remember, man, he saw, saw you good enough, I suppose, to die for. He loved you enough to die for you. I hope that we could have the mentality that, man, he is worthy enough to live for him. Just go all out. Just see, see what he would do. Amen? Well, as you guys uh, go out today and start this new year, um, I just wanted you to know, for one, I'm praying for you guys, um, and I'm here for you if you need prayer. I know that life has a lot of things. There's goods, bads, uglies, but um, we're here for you guys, and I hope that you see that. But on your way out, take some resources with you, that being books. Again, everybody, I want to encourage you all, even if you hate reading, grab a copy of Ordinary Servant. Let's make it our goal that every single one of us would read this in 21 days. Again, I think you could read it easily this afternoon. Um, but learn to love reading. Re leaders or readers or readers or leaders, um, however that goes. But then also, if you want to take yourself to another challenge or maybe you really love reading, grab another book. But um, just only grab one. There's not a whole lot of the other ones. But grab one, and I hope that it would challenge you, bless you this new year. And have this in your mind. This is something that um, my counselor, therapist, uh, told me once. And so there was a point in my life where I had to go see counseling. I went once a month, and it was kind of like a mini rehab thing without um, going to rehab. But I did a lot of a lot of bad choices. I used to be a bit of a drug addict um, back in the day. And so when I was coming out of this, my mom would be like, why don't you go to rehab or something? And I'd just say, you know, I can quit any day. I can quit on my own. I don't need that. And, um, she's like, okay, we'll go ahead and do that. You know, and I'd stop for a day or two and say, I see mom, I, I could quit whenever I want. And then I would just party that much harder because I had to make up for the last couple of days. But one day she said, why don't you just go to a Chris Christian counselor? Uh, I'll find you someone you can go see them. And I, you know, at first I don't want to go, I don't need help. And finally I said, fine, I'll go once and I'll go, I'm going to go for you. 
And I went that day and I went there and the guy just asked me something simple, said, what's, what's going on in your life? And I broke down into tears and I told him, I said, my life's a wreck. I said, I'm a drug addict, an alcoholic, my best friend, two of them are in prison. My girlfriend broke up with me. Um, I went to jail. I've lo- lost my license, um, all this stuff and all that. And so I just, anyways, I was a wreck. And so I come before him and it, that was kind of the beginning of my my me fighting the war at all before that I wasn't even trying and then through that I saw him for three years every month for three years there and the first year is probably pretty ugly right I was a I was a mess and uh, I was trying to get my life right I didn't know how but then this guy had a lot of interesting things for me but I want to share this with you and it changed my perspective and it's really straight from Jesus and one time he said Nick where do you want to be in five years, what do you see yourself doing? And you know, and I believed in Jesus, and I wanted to do big things. And I said, I don't know, I'll, maybe I'll be like a, a youth teacher or something, and encourage people like for Bibles. And I, I was thought of Francis Chan. Honestly, I was like, I want to be like Francis Chan, like that dude. The first time I ever heard him, I went to a youth camp in high school, and he was the teacher for that whole week. And that was before anyone really knew who Francis Chan was. And I'm like, who is this guy? And he was the first person I ever saw, heard, teach the Word of God. And I'm like, that guy believes what he's saying right now. Like, I believe everything he says. I want to hear more of it. Anyways, so I said, maybe I want to be like something like that, a, a motivational speaker. I even think I said that to him, which I'm like, I know that was poor choice of words, but um, I want to be a motivational speaker. And he said, well, Nick, what do you got to do to get there? Uh, and then I was like, I don't know. And so anyways, what he told me is he's like, because uh, I struggle with getting drunk and high, right? He said, well, can you do today? Right? Can you just do today, right? Because my struggle is I don't know if I can make it tomorrow. I don't know what, if about next week. I don't know about next year. Certainly not five years from now. I'm, I can't make it five years, right? But he said, Nick, can you just do today? I said, oh, I could do today, right? It changed my whole perspective when he just said, Nick, can you go today without getting drunk and high, without making a mistake? Can you just do today? I said, yeah, I can do today. And you know what Jesus says? He says, worry about today. Don't don't worry about tomorrow. He says, today has enough problems of its own. So as you and I go out this year, we start to fight our battles. We start to wage war, right? In the spiritual realm, we're going to, we're going to give, pray fast. We're going to seek the Lord. We're going to Come before him. I just want to encourage you, take it one day at a time. You look at the whole week, it's overwhelming. Oh man, you know, I got this, that, and the other thing going on. It's overwhelming, but can you do today? When you boil it down to one day, you're like, you know what? I can make it through today without getting mad at someone, without losing my cool ear, without making a bad mistake. I can do today. I can pray and fast today. Tomorrow, I don't know. I might be grumpy, but I can do today. So again, my encouragement as we go out, just have that mindset that Jesus says, just worry about today. Can you do today? And make that your goal. And then tomorrow you wake up, same mindset. I don't need to worry about the next day. Can you do today? All right, if you guys need anything, we're here for you. But uh, go out there, have a good week, grab some books there. And uh, again, no small groups this week. But also, if you want to look for some extracurricular material, I'm going to be putting out some, um, some devos throughout this 21 days that you guys can find on the YouTube and Instagram. Um, just hopefully encourage you guys. But with all that said, go out there, live a fervent life so the people may know Jesus.